the 31st annual Sydney B. Sperry Symposium, Go Ye Into All the World, Messages of the New Testament Apostles. The following presentation, Agency and Self-Deception in the Writings of James and 1 John, was given by Dr. Terence Olson from BYU's School of Family Life. My title, Agency and Self-Deception in the Writings of James and 1 John, I've been told by friendly people is both intimidating and sleep-inducing. Uh, the second part of that, the sleep-inducing, it may fit right into your purpose for being here. But the first, the, the intimidating part, I do not want to be because I, I want what we say to be accessible, direct, applicable to everyday life. I'm starting with the first half of a verse from James 4.17. And that verse is, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not. Now that's going to be a statement from James once I complete it, but I want to use it in the form of a question. What is life like for you and I when we go against that which we know to do good? When we go against that which we believe is right? Uh, the consequence of that we're going to discover is self-deception, a concept quite neglected at least in our everyday culture, but fundamental to the writings of James and John. And the reason that we're looking at both of those brethren is because they offer two witnesses regarding the same concept. My academic mentor, Terry Warner, has written extensively in both the philosophical domain and the social science domain regarding the impact of self-deception on everyday life. And of course, he's not foreign to the scriptural foundations of the concept of self-deception either. But one day, with a group of people visiting his home, they expressed a concern about the abstract and complex nature of the idea of self-deception. Thus, uh, in, a, in a nutshell, they felt intimidated by the whole idea. And they were concerned that everyday run-of-the-mill people, as you and I are, might not be able to understand the concept. So Terry, Terry called his 45-year-old daughter over and said, Katie, explain to me what happens when you know what is right and you don't do it. And she said, well, you know what's right and you don't do it, and so you're fussed in your mind. There's the simplest definition I know to make non-intimidating the source of where our self-deceptions come from. Consider this possibility, and, and these considerations are fundamental to you making sense out of what I'm going to do in, in the sense that I'm making these assumptions, okay? So consider, is it true that we best understand commandments only when we live them? Or is it possible that when we disobey commandments, we no longer understand the gospel or those commandments in an honest way? James and John, I'm claiming, understood the causes and consequences of being self-deceived. So there's this question. What if understanding this concept, as they did, could enhance how the gospel blesses our lives? My belief is that what these brethren had to say centuries ago spans time and dispensations and are as applicable today in our lives as they were to the saints that James and John were addressing. Could it be that the truth about ourselves applies to everyday life, every day? That's going to be my claim. Our goal is to examine the consequences of James' assertion that it is possible for us to know to do good and do with it not. Many of you would recognize that that would be a key idea to what it means to be a moral agent. We've got to see moral meaning. We've got to be able to respond to that moral meaning. And we've got to have the wherewithal to either be true or false to the moral meaning we see, to the moral call that comes to us, to our prompting of conscience, to the light within. There are a variety of ways to talk about humans as moral agents. But we'll do two things. Number one, we will discover that when we do not do what we believe is right, that we become self-deceived. And two, we will find that it is possible to be free of self-deception and that obedience to the gospel is a blessing that frees us from many of the anxieties of everyday life. This is significant, in my opinion, because very often we feel overwhelmed by the events of everyday life. A common phrase designed to comfort us, comfort us in how overwhelmed we can become 
uh, is this, the, the, the phrase is, I try to take it one day at a time, but every now and then two or three days attack me all at once. In that notion is the idea that we are somehow constantly victims of the demands of life. And while we face demands and challenges and surprises and the unexpected and injustice and sorrow, I wish to make a case that because we are moral agents, we have the ability in every moment to respond in a moral way to whatever it is that is cast in our direction. There is a difference between, for example, sorrow and bitterness. And the difference is whether or not we respond to injustice in, in compassionate humility or in hostile, resentful resi uh, resistance. Well, consider. Think of the last time you felt it was right to do something and you refused to do it. Let's take James's comment and put it into our everyday life. Perhaps it was a little thing like reading a book to your five-year-old at bedtime or visiting your brother in the hospital. It could have been an act that demanded more in time, such as driving to a neighboring state to attend your niece's wedding. It could mean giving a Saturday of service cleaning up the church's girls' camp. No matter what the examples might be, they consist of something you sense is right to do, that you have the ability to do, of course. But you are a moral agent, capable of living true or false to your sense of what is right. If you act favorably, yea, even willingly, on your feeling regarding what is right, you proceed to read the book, or make the visit, or drive to the wedding, or go to girls' camp. You do these things without a second thought, and probably without moral fanfare. As examples or stories of moral or ethical conduct, there is little to tell about these incidents, when we do right, I mean, except to recall the memories of them. Remember the time when we... However, if we know and believe to do these good things and do them not, or we do them grudgingly or resentfully, there is a story to tell. Suddenly, an otherwise straightforward and perhaps even mundane event becomes significant. Now the story to be told is a moral tale, for the heart of the story is in our refusal to do as we believe. Had we been true to our sense of what was right to do, it would not occur to us to have to explain ourselves. But when we are false to our beliefs, there is much to explain. When my response to my five-year-old's request to read a book is to go against what I believe is right, I might then say to myself, boy, I'm, I'm really tired tonight. Or, well, he's too tired tonight for us to go through a book. Or, you know, he wasn't very well behaved at dinner. Or, uh, I, I have a big report due tomorrow. Remember, if we're saying all these things in the context of believing that what the right thing to do is to read a book to our boy, then they have a different meaning in spite of the fact that we are invoking realities that are seemingly inescapable. If the comments I've just offered you are given in the context of believing that I should read a book to my boy, I'm knowing to do good, and I'm doing it not. They become rationalizations of wrongdoing. They become attempts to make the wrong we're doing appear to be right, or at least not wrong, and I'm using Terry Warner's language in that instance. They are symptoms of a problem being experienced by someone, me, who is no longer living the truth in relationships with others. These symptoms are evidence of more than mere ignorance and more than being blinded by the demands or pressures of life. How often do we say, well, I was just under a lot of pressure? Again, pressure may be real, demands may be inescapable. But when we experience those in the face of going against what we believe is right, now it's not just that we're trying to figure out how to respond to pressure. Now we are using the pressure to excuse ourselves from a felt moral obligation. In other words, this kind of refusal I'm talking about and these kinds of rationalizations are signs of self-deception. James understood the link between knowing the truth and living the truth, and he described the instability in life that comes when we are double-minded. I'm working, he used that phrase in James 1 and 8. Uh, being double-minded involves willfully refusing to live that which we know. His counsel was, be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. For if any be a hearer of the word and not a doer, 
He is like unto a man beholding his natural face in a glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. John bears an additional witness to this condition, affirming that the very way we experience life is different when we are obedient than when we are not. From John, he that loveth his brother abideth in the light, and there is none occasion of stumbling in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. Since the blindness, now think about this, since the blindness was produced by walking in darkness, okay, and since we are free to walk in darkness, our blindness is self-inflicted. Or, regarding the stumbling metaphor used by James, we do not stumble at all spiritually when the hallmark of our life is love for our brother. It is our refusal to love that creates our spiritual problems. And those problems cause us to stumble because we've lost an understanding of where they came from. Perhaps the reason obedience is the first law of heaven is that without obedience, we do not see clearly the possibility or reality of heaven. We do not see that the Savior is the light of the world. We are in darkness. We stumble. We forget what manner of person we are. But we cannot attribute these problems to sources outside ourselves. We are blind because of our own refusal to see. As Jacob, the son of Lehi, noted, Woe unto the blind that will not see, for they shall perish. It is likely the first casualty of refusing to see is a loss of an understanding of the truth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. It is evident, then, that it is in our response to the gospel. It is in our response to the gospel. That is, how we act upon it, and not how it acts upon us, that reveals who and what we see, who and what we are, in any given moment. Our disobedience changes our world, changes what we see, changes what we understand, it changes how we relate to others. We then live with a self-deceived understanding of what we are experiencing. James defines such behavior with a term that may seem harsh in our culture. The complete phrase from James that I started with is, Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Now, <laughs> sin is not a popular explanation in our culture of what our culture has come to see as mere imperfection or mere inescapable human feelings. How many times have you heard the phrase, oh, well, we're only human? I do not hear young people, old people, I don't hear anybody ever saying, well, we're only human, at the uh, moment of their success, of their responsibility, of their commitment, of their sacrifice. When, when you help uh, a member of the elders' quorum move on a Saturday morning in spite of the rose bushes that you must uh, prune, at the end, when the fellow you've helped move says, oh, thank you very much, do you say, well, <laughs> I'm only human? No, it, it's, it's when we're trying to explain away the bad news or our resistance or our refusal to help that we say, well, look, I'm, I'm human too. So it's significant to me that we use that phrase when we are uh, almost apologetic for something that maybe we believe we should have done. Deny, to deny sin as a source of some mortal troubles can itself be a symptom of being self-deceived. After all, if I can attribute my sins to things I can't help, to my imperfections, I have nothing to repent of. And the best I can do, even with those feelings I regret, is cope. Besides, if James is going to lay blame at my feet for something that is just human nature, <laughs> then on top of all my other troubles, that just creates guilt. I certainly don't need guilt as an additional stumbling block. But perhaps there is a better answer. Perhaps we can actually be free of certain recurring attitudes and feelings that seem to us to be inescapable. Perhaps James takes seriously an idea in our culture that, well, that our culture too readily dismisses. Perhaps dismissing James' testimony is already an act of self-deception, and that dismissal leaves us blind and trapped in a self-deceived world. At the least, it seems we have neglected in everyday life and in our attempts to explain ourselves to each other the idea and implications of being self-deceived. Yet the scriptures indicate that such refusals are the acts of responsible, accountable agents and that such refusals are sin. 
Evidently, self-deception is more than an abstract term that describes someone who doesn't see the truth. It's a concept that actually accounts for how being blind to the truth is possible. By definition, to be self-deceived is to have engaged in an act that produces a false view of one's circumstances. To be self-deceived is to be blind to the truth of a situation. This blindness includes at least two features. One, seeing the truth falsely as not the truth at all. And two, being blind to the fact that one's own act has produced that view. Given this kind of blindness, it seems that if I am self-deceived, I cannot access the knowledge that would set me free, and so I cannot escape. Also, since I do not know I am deceived, and I do not know I have produced the deception, I will even reject the attempts of observers to enlighten me. I will see such efforts as evidence that they are meddlers, prejudiced, or irrational. Clearly, to take the idea of self-deception seriously might seem impossible to the self-deceived. The epistles of James and John address the problem of self-deception more fully than any other place in the scriptures. Both of them ground the problem as a symptom of wrongdoing. James boldly proclaims, as we have started with, to him that knoweth to do good and doeth it not, to him it is sin. Sin and self-deception are inextricably linked. The book of 1 John is a testimony of Jesus Christ and a call to obedience. It's the theme of the whole book. In almost every chapter, the author contrasts the condition of the obedient with that of the disobedient. In testifying of the fellowship the saints can experience with the Father and the Son, John unequivocally declares, This, then, is the message which we have heard of him and declare unto you, that God is light, and in him is no darkness at all. If we say that we have fellowship with him and walk in darkness, we lie and do not the truth. But if we walk in the light as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. If we say that we have no sin when we do, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. So, a contrast is established immediately between walking in the light and walking in darkness. Walking in darkness is characterized by our doing not the truth, uh, by the truth not being in us. This is significant commentary because it suggests that those who are self-deceived no longer see, experience, or understand the truth. This blindness to the truth is not due to ignorance, but to a refusal to walk in the light. But remember, that refusal is something that we are doing. Remember the phrase, and we do not the truth? That kind of doing makes the truth inaccessible to us, or the truth is not in us. In 1 John chapter 2, the author continues the theme. He that saith, I know him, and keepeth not his commandments, is a liar, and the truth is not in him. But he that hateth his brother is in darkness, and walketh in darkness, and knoweth not whither he goeth, because that darkness hath blinded his eyes. And in a final example from chapter 4 in 1 John, there is no fear in love, but perfect love casteth out fear, because fear hath torment. He that feareth is not made perfect in love. If a man say, I love God, and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? James also addresses the meaning of how people experience life when they do not live by the truth they know, but be ye doers of the word and not hearers only, deceiving your own selves. Such self-deception is further defined by James, which is the theme of our talk. So, thus far we know that self-deception is produced by disobedience, which is by definition sin. So what? Either this is a conclusion so obvious that it need not take up too much of our time, or we fail to see its significance in our everyday lives, especially for those who generally seek to take the gospel seriously. Seemingly, the counsel to those self-deceived is to repent. End of story. But we also know that to be self-deceived is to be blind to the truth, including the truths that others might tell us about our being in sin. How does a person who is self-deceived respond to the truth-telling of others? If self-deception is produced by a refusal to walk in the light, self-deceived persons will resist the light offered them about their sin. The scripture suggests that self-deception is produced by a free act, an act of refusal to walk in the light, to do the truth, to knowingly not do good, to be a hearer rather than a doer, and so on. This act of refusal is evidence of humans as moral agents, for if the act of 
of refusal were not voluntary. Freely chosen, that is. The individual could not be held accountable for the act. As affirmed in the Book of Mormon by Samuel the Lamanite, and now remember, remember, my brethren, that whosoever perisheth, perisheth unto himself, and whosoever doeth iniquity, doeth it unto himself. For behold, ye are free, ye are permitted to act for yourselves. For behold, God hath given unto you a knowledge, and he hath made you free. He hath given unto you that ye might know good from evil, and he hath given unto you that ye might choose life or death. And ye can do good, and be restored unto that which is good, or have that which is good restored unto you, or ye can do evil and have that which is evil restored unto you. That's Helaman 14, 30, 31. Thus, self-deception is a condition moral agents can bring upon themselves by a free refusal to respond to the truth. This refusal produces costs, one of which is being self-deceived. So, when we have a sense of what is right to do and we do it not, we create a false way of seeing and a false way of being to which we are blind. We are as blind to the solutions to these types of problems as we are to our role in creating them in the first place. My own experience affirms this possibility. When I think of the time I was irritated about how one of the neighbor's children had stomped through my newly planted garden, I, <laughs> I confess there was no room in my heart during my irritated feelings for forgiveness. Nor, if you had asked me at the time why I was troubled, I would not have said, oh, well, I need to repent. Yet at that very moment, I was neither forgiving nor repentant. Rather, I was consumed with how my gardening efforts had been ruined by a thoughtless child. And make no mistake, in my irritation that that child had become the enemy to me, one of the little ones, no other way of seeing the situation made sense to me at the time. On another occasion, I found myself delayed at an intersection where I was waiting. With my turn signal flashing, I was trying to turn left. I had to wait because of one, only one, oncoming and amazingly slow-moving car. It seemed that I had been waiting an eternity, and, and I'm not exaggerating here, for this creeping mass of metal to get by me so I could turn. Then, as this car entered the intersection, it nonchalantly and without warning turned left. Had I known earlier of the driver's intention, my path would have been clear because the driver hadn't exercised the same courtesy I was, using my left-hand turn signal as automakers and the state driving manual had intended, I had waited unnecessarily. I, that wait must have cost me at least 20 seconds, all because some other driver was so frivolous and discourteous as to not use a simple turn signal. My car's tires squealed as I made a long-awaited left turn. I, I'm sure I muttered something at that point out loud about what kind of people they let drive these days. I don't recall the phrase, do unto others, or love thy neighbor, coming into my mind as I drove the final few blocks to my house. So, such ideas at that time would have seemed so unrealistic to me, in that situation anyway. I also can remember once speaking in a public meeting where I was being critical of the practices of one of my child's teachers. My wife was busy pulling on my sleeve. I successfully ignored her until I realized the teacher about whom I was complaining was in the audience. Now I know why she was pulling on my sleeve. It was not enough that the audience didn't know who I was speaking of. The teacher knew. I knew. I felt fleetingly that it was a shame that someone's incompetence had to be publicly displayed like that. Incidentally, the incompetence about which I was reflecting was uh, not my own. The idea of conducting myself with meekness and lowliness of heart was foreign to me in that meeting. These are everyday incidents, I know. Some would even claim that they are merely mundane evidences that we are imperfect or that we often lose control or that all of us are trying to learn to cope better with the challenges and burdens of life. Those who see the garden or the turn signal incident as trivial. M might even say, well, there's so many much greater things, Terry, to worry about in life that we should bite our collective tongues over the little things and worry about coping with the big things. I believe these so-called little things have much to do with the quality of our lives, and they're the foundation of the quality of our marriages, our families, 
our business and church relationships, not only in the present moment, but in the kingdoms we look forward to inheriting after this life. In each of these incidents, the person telling these stories, me, is self-deceived. That means I am, in the moment I am living these stories, more than merely ignorant. It means I'm doing more than denying the truth of the situation. The truth of the situation is I don't see the truth. If during my irritation with the child, or during my impatience with the driver of the slow, non-signaling auto, or during my uncompassionate public criticism of the teacher, someone had told me I was hard-hearted or unforgiving or unrepentant, I would have met the charge with what I would have considered to be justified disbelief. I would have been blind to my need for compassion for the child. I would have seen, by the way, such a notion as mere indulgence. You know, you can't let these kids get away with these things. Or if I was supposed to be compassionate with the driver of the other car. I mean, in that moment, remember, I didn't think he deserved to be rewarded for anything, for being so inconsiderate as to not use a signal. Or, of course, I would have had an explanation for my uncompassionate criticism of a teacher. In fact, instead of considering my attitude or my actions in these situations as being a problem, I would have considered myself as being victimized by the other people. They're causing the problem. They're the ones responsible for disrupting my world. They're the source of my difficulties. Preach to them, I might say, to anyone challenging my responses. Moreover, I would have seen those challenging my responses as stumbling blocks. These responses that I'm describing and putting myself in as an example are more than human failings that we can't help doing, as I believe our culture often teaches. These responses are not simply a denial of the truth. They are expressions of having refused to see and to live by the truth. Such refusals are symptoms of disobedience, of a refusal to walk in the light. Such disobedience means we begin to deceive ourselves about the truth. I, I know this because these are my stories. I can see what I was in those moments. And once I gave up my refusal to do good, I saw the truth of those situations. And the first thing I saw was my role in them. The fact that I was creating feelings, attitudes, resentments, hostilities, justifications. But I was blind to the truth. I believe that when we do not do what we ought to do, uh, and, and by the way, I didn't know that then, but I know now that what I didn't know during those incidents, while I was being uncompassionate or hard-hearted or whatever you want to call it, I was absolutely blind to the truth. Only when I later quit refusing to see the truth, when I quit refusing to live it, I should say, if I'm going to be true to James and John's witness, and I began living obediently to all that I knew about how I'm to treat my neighbors. Oh, and by the way, what, who is my neighbor? Only then did I find the truth both realistic and a blessing. A blessing because in spite of the fact that I now saw my role in the problem, I understood in meekness and humility the source of that problem. Until I returned to obedience, I found the truth unrealistic and, and as a burden. To summarize that, as a moral agent, I had refused to live the truth. I became blind to it. I was, in fact, self-deceived. Once I gave up my sin, John's testimony made perfect sense to me. Oh, so if we say that we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. John's description of the reality of self-deception and of the cause, this refusal to admit to sin when we are, in fact, sinful, would have been either lost on me or would have been an irritant while I was refusing to live truthfully. But once I repent and return to the light, the idea of self-deception makes perfect sense and becomes a relatively important feature of how we understand the human condition. After all, if through disobedience I become blind to the truth, the truth is not in me, how am I to understand the truth of myself and my condition at all? In such a condition, all my explanations of my actions will also be self-deceived. It's not the truth on these matters, by the way, that the reason I did not read the book to my child was because he was tired or I was tired or that he had misbehaved or that I had a report me. Those explanations only occurred to me after I had become self-deceived, after I had refused to do the good that I believed I should. My explanations then, those explanations so simple, became justifications for my disobedience rather than straightforward descriptions of an honest moral choice. 
Similarly, I was walking in darkness in my attitude toward the oncoming car, and my irritation over the lack of using a turn signal was just self-righteousness. That's all I was doing. My complaints against the teacher in a public meeting were not honest criticism, which is how I would have described it while I was self-deceived. It was dishonest resentment. All that changed, by the way, not because any of these people changed, but because I did. I have wondered how my change came about. I am convinced, of course, that my way of being in the self-deceived incidents I have disclosed is understood by James and John, hence this presentation. They see the consequences fully. James links many specific acts of disobedience to not seeing the truth of a situation. Two examples. Let no man say when he is tempted, uh, for God neither tempteth he any man. Do we see ourselves as victims God, of God when in temptation? This is a deceived view compared to the truth. But every man is tempted when he is drawn away of his own lust and enticed. This is an example of being a hearer of the word and not a doer, and thus deceiving our own selves. Also, if any man among you seem to be religious and bridleth not his tongue, but deceiveth his own heart, this man's religion is vain. To seem to be religious stands in contrast to being religious as it, and is also an expression of being self-deceived. Similarly, John notes that to be self-deceived is to be a liar. Yet in sin, we not only lie about the truth, but believe the lie that we tell. Terry Warner calls this more than telling a lie, it is living a lie, as described by John again. This is what it means that the truth is not in him. Or if a man say, I love God and hateth his brother, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? By the way, the idea of simultaneously loving God and hating a brother is conceptually and practically impossible. But those immersed in hate, those who are self-deceived by their own sin of a refusal to love, are blind to the truth of that statement, would they not be? The common threads of how self-deceived persons see themselves and their circumstances include, not surprisingly, a sense of being helpless in the face of what others are doing to them, and it includes a defensiveness that looks absolutely necessary to them. This view swallows up any sense of personal responsibility for creating or perpetuating the problem, and it obliterates the possibility that they are participating in any way in a refusal to walk in the light. Think of what I muttered in my mind against the driver of that other car when I was waiting to turn left. Wasn't my circumstance completely dependent on them? Wasn't I a victim of their inconsiderateness? Did I in any way consider my own role in the problem? Absolutely not. Nor would it occur to the self-deceived that they are engaging in a freely chosen walk in darkness. But these are the fruits of self-deception, consistent with how self-deception is described in James and 1 John. When that darkness born of our refusal to do the good that we know blinds our eyes, we do not see our way out. After all, we now don't see how we played a role in getting ourselves into self-deception. Moreover, no sense of being personally responsible for the helplessness is experienced either. If so, by the way, if you and I saw what we were doing in the moment we were doing it, we wouldn't be deceived about our role in producing the problem. Now, this analysis is a logical extension of the reality that the truth is not being in us when we're going against the light. At a more general level, being self-deceived is to find the gospel to be a burden. How often have people expressed to you, or how often have you in fact felt, that the gospel includes expectations that are too hard to live up to? I believe that's often a uh, feature of our general culture. I don't mean just uh, public culture in Utah, but public culture in the United States. Very often those who are religious are portrayed as being burdened by the beliefs they carry. If those beliefs include things like love thy neighbor as thyself, if they include humility, meekness, sacrifice, love unfeigned, doing unto others as you would have them do unto you, how are those principles a burden? Well, if you make the assumption at the beginning that the gospel itself is a burden, then all those other kinds of things follow. When we, many people walk around in life, consider themselves to be trapped by victims of or, or bear a guilt visited upon them by outside sources about which they cannot do nothing and that outside source often includes the commandments. Now, this is not because the Lord's commandments are burdensome, but because when we fail to respond to them in humility and meekness, 
we deceive ourselves about their meaning. Seeing the commandments as a burden is a perfect way to rationalize and justify our refusal to respond to them in humility. When we do not the truth, we are doing a lie. That lie includes the self-deceived view that our refusal to give our best, our refusal to call upon the atonement, is someone else's fault, even perhaps God's fault. How often do people ask the question, God, why did you do this to me? That very question, the spirit of its asking, is so often typically in bitterness rather than in humility. The person not only cannot receive an answer, but wouldn't recognize an answer if it were given. The self-deceived see their own imperfections, the gospel, and often life itself then, as a burden instead of a blessing. Escaping self-deception begins with a willingness to admit that we are, after all, moral agents. And the crucial point about being moral agents is not in the mere matter of choice, but in our free, unrestricted opportunity and obligation to choose the right. Lehi's witness about, the, about moral agency matches the position of Samuel the Lamanite cited earlier. Lehi affirms that when we do not choose the right, we choose consequences that we cannot escape. Now, this is significant in our own time. I am involved in public school curricula of character and citizenship issues. And one of the things I would prefer we not teach our young people is the idea that we need to teach them how to accept the consequences or accept responsibility for the consequences of their choices. Here's why that's a problem. The consequences we set in motion when we make certain choices are not independent of, they're not separate of the choice itself. When we make a choice that, that puts certain consequences in motion, the responsibility for those consequences lies in the choice, not in some later act where we say, oh, I think I'll take responsibility for those consequences that I set in motion, unless we mean this by that, that approach. If when I set certain consequences in motion that are negative, if when I am self-deceived and go against what I believe is right, I produce destructive consequences, I wouldn't see myself as responsible for them unless I gave up my self-deception. So what youth need to understand is they won't see their role in the consequences they produced until they give up whatever light or truth or prompting they're going against that set those consequences in motion in the first place. And then when youth or you and I give up our self-deceptions, then and only then do we see our role in pr promoting those consequences that may have destructive outcomes for other people even. And now we're horrified by who we were in the moment we set those consequences in motion. So to make the choice is to choose the consequences already. Men are free according to the flesh, free to choose liberty and eternal life through the great mediator of all men, or to choose captivity and death. John, in his discourse on living the truth, identified the problem of self-deception and also declared the avenue of escape. It seems to me I've been so relentless on the notion that we are self-deceived uh, often that we better take some time today to show how you get out of the problem. Giving up a self-deceived view of others often reveals that we only become free of our resentments toward them uh, and, and that we want them to never have sinned against us in the first place. But when we do not the truth, the truth of the motives, the attitudes, and the actions of others is unavailable to us. And our fellowship with one another can range from being shallow to being hypocritical. The difference between doing the truth and doing self-deception is the difference described by King Benjamin of the mighty change of heart. Because of the spirit of the Lord omnipotent, which has wrought a mighty change in us or in our hearts, that we have no more disposition to do evil, but to do good continually. And the evil resistant alternative described elsewhere as being in a deep sleep as to the things of God, these descriptions are consistent with James and John's rendition of self-deception as being produced by sin and of the alternative. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship one with another, and the blood of Jesus Christ cleanseth us from all sin. That is a fundamental, realistic starting point for anyone to be free of self-deception. The attitudes and even emotions of the two worlds I'm talking about here, doing self-deception versus doing the truth, are incompatible. A disposition to do evil or walking in darkness cannot simultaneously be an expression of having lost that disposition and be walking in the light. 
So the world of sin and self-deception are absolutely distinguishable from the alternative world of obedience. Once a person is living or doing qualities associated with obedience, the alternative disobedient qualities are not in us. Now, here are examples of these incompatibilities. I'm trying to, to sketch that when we walk in, in life in a, one way, we see the truth of even what we're doing. When we deceive ourselves, we walk in the world another way and we're blind to the truth. Here are seven contrasts from James and John regarding this matter. Well, these seven are from James, okay? Be swift to hear rather than slow, James 1, 19. Two, be slow to wrath rather than quick-tempered. That's also James 1, 19. Be doers, not hearers only, James 1, 22. Bridleth his tongue versus unbridled and thus deceived in his own heart, James 1, 26. Number five. Visit the fatherless and widows, versus neglecting them, obviously, James 1, 27. Uh, faith without works, versus faith by my works, James, Joseph Smith translation of James 2, 15. And finally, he that knoweth to do good, versus doeth it not, James 4, 17. None of the categories of being obedient that I've just tried to describe can coexist with the categories of a refusal to be obedient. You can't stand up and sit down at the same time, correct? And in that refusal to walk in the light, for example, comes our self-deceived understanding of what we've done. If self-deception is produced by a free act, and by the way, here's the reason that we in the gospel, in the gospel of the restoration, have hope instead of being limited by the world to merely having to cope, okay? If our self-deception is produced by a free act, then escaping it must be a free act also. If being self-deceived is a refusal to live the truth, then giving up that refusal is the heart of being restored to an understanding, maybe even a vision, of what the truth really is. Thus, the problem is not a matter of ignorance or lack of skill or even some lack of practice in some behavior, although all those things might be helpful when we're living the truth. Being free of self-deception begins in willingness not ability. If being free of self-deception requires a change of heart, then only a moral agent willing to be true to the light can experience the fellowship with Christ promised those who walk in the light. The change necessary to be free of self-deception is a matter of obedience. Yet, all of us have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. So all of us are imperfect. Thus, all of us have participated in self-deception. A harsh term for our condition when we're self-deceived is hypocrisy, and many Christians whose failings are all too visible have been subjected to such accusation. I remember George Bernard Shaw, who I believe wanted himself known as an agnostic rather than as atheist, rather than as an atheist, nevertheless did not quite have a positive view of, of Christianity. And at a party once, uh, I guess there was some Christian bashing going on, and somebody made the remark uh, about how hypocritical Christians were, and uh, my belief is that Bernard Shaw, in responding to that comment, was being sarcastic rather than ironic. But in response to the Christian bashing, he said, Now, 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 don't be too hard on the Christians. The only problem with Christianity is that in 2,000 years, nobody's tried it. Now look, that paints a brush that requires that we be either perfect or, and, and by the way, perfection is, is considered absolutely necessary if you're not going to be hypocrites. So the only, only alternative way to, to figure things out is, well, since we're all imperfect, I guess we're all hypocrites. But that is a hostile view of what the Lord is offering us. Other hearers of the word who fail to be doers sometimes report they feel guilty. So guilty they're burdened by the commandments, as we talked about earlier, ever fearful that since they can never be perfect, they are doomed to guilty despair. This presents a curious situation. The gospel is a gospel of hope, not despair. And James and John are issuing a call to obedience meant to nourish the idea that if we confess our sins, yea, our little sins of, of being hostile to a little boy that runs through your garden, if, if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. Moreover, the fruits of obedience described elsewhere in the scriptures as pure religion include what? To visit the fatherless and widows in their affliction. In other words, love thy neighbor as thyself, and to keep yourself unspotted from the world. Thus, there, there is no non-self-deceived reason for would-be saints to experience a sense of guilt when they read passages such as James 4.17. Therefore, to him that knoweth to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. 
Rather, they're free to see it as merely guilt unto repentance and as an invitation to give up their burdened world of experience. At the least, we can propose that those whose response to the gospel is to despair are somehow deceived about the spirit and meaning of the call in the first place. And according to James and John, seeing the truth falsely is evidence of self-deception. The truth is not in those who are offended or burdened by the light, precisely because they are doing not the truth. Specifically, we can over offer hope for people like me who, through disobedience or hard-heartedness, we can give it all up. We can be left with compassion for our neighbor children, for fellow drivers, for imperfect teachers. I neither need to indulge when others are engaged in wrongdoing by excusing them or by pretending they have not sinned. Oh, she's just having a bad day. We don't have to excuse people. We can see their imperfections as compassionately as we see our own. We will not feel to harshly condemn others as a way of justifying our own hostility. I will then, giving up my self-deception, tell the truth in love and sorrow. If I must testify to an officer, for example, regarding how a car weaving in traffic startled a girl whose car then rolled three times, I will do so in sorrow, not in arrogance. I will not do it in a self-promoting way. In brief, I will love others. I will pray for them in humility. I will sorrow when they sin. I'll nourish them in their concern for others. Only by walking in the light myself and repenting of the times I have not will I likely be able to invite others to live a life of love and sacrifice and commitment and humility. Others will either take offense, which is Terry Warner's term for becoming hard-hearted or in sin, at my self-deceptive way of being, or at my humility. We don't want to take offense at other people's good example, do we? Other people's response to me reveals whether they have joined me in my world of self-deception or have remained true to the faith. The world others live in may include rejecting our honest offerings of humility, but we need not join them in darkness. Just because they are offensive towards us need not mean that we are offensive toward them. There is no place, for example, for something like vengeance or revenge for the one who walks in the light. To consider ourselves above or below others are examples of dark responses. We must continue in love and humility and boldness regarding our concern for others in the spirit, as the spirit prompts us to be concerned for others. Self-deception, then, is an inescapable consequence of wrongdoing. Giving up self-deception is only possible in the act of obedience, and that act comes from within. It is that act that moral agents are capable of. It is an affirmation of our love of God to love our brother. The Savior's call to us who labor and are heavy laden is to come unto him, of course, and that call is absolutely realistic absolutely the source of finding our circumstances to be a blessing. James and John knew that. It applied in their time and their space. It implies in our time and in our everyday life. I so bear witness to the fact that when I live the truth and walk in the light, I become part of the solution to the challenges I face in everyday life. And when I go against the light that I have and become hard-hearted, I become part of the problem of the situations and challenges I face in everyday life. My belief is that the Holy Ghost and the light of Christ within us are available to us to do what is right in the present moment and do what is right and let the consequence follow. I bear witness of that and that the restoration's insights into James and John are fundamental to the whole world's coming to the light. And I say that in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen. For more information on this program, visit our website at broadcasting.byu.edu. This presentation was given at Brigham Young University on October 26, 2002.